Welcome to the nano metropolis of the living world. We're talking about cells, and this will be the first of several chapters where we investigate all of the complex things that are happening in the simplest form of life, the cell. Just to catch our bearings, where we are is we've just talked about molecules and uh, macromolecules, and now we're going to jump up here to the next level, and we're going to talk about organelles and cells. We'll stay here for a while before we start uh, progressing our way forward to talk about an entire organ system or an organism. Uh, a real brief overview here. The one who's generally credited for discovering the cell is this gentleman, Robert Hooke. And he was a engineer, an architect, a, uh, he liked looking at the stars. He was just kind of an all-around uh, inventive renaissance type man. And he had a microscope. And looking through that microscope, he was observing cork wood, you know, just the same as like a, this would be in like a wine bottle cork. And when you look at cork wood, um, it has very distinct uh, partitions between the various parts of the tissue. And when he looked at these, uh, we're actually looking at an electron micrograph, so much more detail than what Robert Hooke would have seen. But nevertheless, he looked at these and he saw that they looked almost like the chambers that monks would hang out in uh, to pray or meditate or uh, show their devotion to God. And at the time, those were called cells. A monk would go reside in his cell. And so that's what he named these little units that seem to form living tissue. And the name stuck, so we call them cells to this day. Uh, some cell facts is that in your body, you have about 50 to 100 trillion cells. Cells are considered the smallest unit of life. And so basically the, the properties that organ systems or organisms will have is somewhat determined by the way that the cells behave. And then there are a whole bunch of different types of cells. In your body alone, there's about 200 different types of cells. But above and beyond that, when we look at the entire uh, living world, I mean, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of different kinds of cells. Some of them are, have some odd characteristics to them. For example, these ones, these are called diatoms. They, wrapping around their, their plasma membrane, have a wall that is made out of silica crystal. And silica crystal is basically glass. So in essence, these have cell walls that are made out of glass. And when you look at how these are arranged, I mean, it's just some stunning... Uh, detail and they're a very diverse category of organism. Diatoms live in bodies of water and they're supposed to be responsible for about 50% of the oxygen that we breathe in the world. Um, they're photosynthetic so they take carbon out of the atmosphere and they replace it with oxygen. They also can accumulate oil within them and so it's thought that um, they go up to the surface of bodies of water, they capture oil with them in these glass Houses and then they sink down to the bottom depths and carry that nutrients down to the to the levels below. Okay, uh, this is a type of organism that looks maybe just like a, a frond of seaweed or something, but it's actually an entire cell. It's really, really, this is the biggest single-celled organism on the planet. Uh, there are very, very small cells. This is Staphylococcus aureus. It's a bacteria that thrives in salty environments and um, very, very common on the surface of your skin. And look at the size here. I mean, this is showing us what two micrometers looks like, and it's only just a small fraction of that bar. So this is maybe one micrometer wide. Uh, your average cell is about 100 micrometers wide, so in essence, these cells are about one one hundredth the size of your cells, very small. Okay, you could have a big monster like this. This is an amoeba, and um, amoebas move in a very strange way. They basically create these like little currents within their cells that draw their contents um, through the cell and extend it onward. So you can see this cell is massive and it's got all of this other types of stuff in it and it just blobs its way across the universe, <laughs> but still nevertheless a cell. Okay, um, these ones are called dinoflagellates and they are a type of protist 
some of them can uh, fluoresce, a characteristic known as bioluminescence, the same thing that like a firefly you might see doing in a hot summer night. Except these live in bodies of water and they only fluoresce when they're mechanically disturbed. So it ends up uh, just creating some very stunning uh, features here. This is, um, I've heard that this happens a lot off the coast of South Africa, but you can see that as the wave crashes, it lights up all of these uh, dinoflagellates and it just creates this stunning glowing um, light that emanates through the water. I'd love to see this someday. I've never seen this actually in person before. Okay, um, while there are gazillions of different types of cells, all cells will have four shared features. One, they all have plasma membranes. We've already talked about the importance of the plasma mem membrane in establishing homeostasis. We talked about how the plasma membrane is composed of these cute little molecules called phospholipids. But there's also a whole bunch of other stuff here in the plasma membrane. The model that we use to describe what a plasma membrane is like is what's known as a fluid mosaic. In other words, the composition of the plasma membrane is predominantly these phospholipids. The phospholipids are basically like little, you know, fat molecules. So they're slippery and they slide uh, back and forth on one another and they're more fluid. So this membrane can kind of uh, oscillate and wave and, and move a bit. It's not just like a rigid wall. But there are things in it um, as well, and that's why we call it a mosaic. A mosaic is uh, a pattern that you make from crushed tile or glass or whatever. And so embedded in this fluid, the, the phospholipids are uh, other types of stuff. So here we're seeing these are different proteins. Proteins can span the entire uh, length of the, or the entire width of the, the membrane, as you see here, or they can just be anchored to one end of it. We're seeing these uh, little steroid molecules. These are actually cholesterol, and cholesterol helps to stiffen up the membrane so it isn't quite so fluid. Uh, so, you know, we often, you know, cholesterol gets a bad rap for uh, being some horrible thing that's in your body, but in fact, you need cholesterol in your cell membranes. And um, it's only when you have a certain type in overabundance can it then cause health complications. But otherwise, cholesterol is definitely essential. You need it. Okay, we'll often, we'll all other times see little carbohydrate molecules that are attached to fatty acids. These would be called glycolipids because glyco referring to sugar uh, attached to a lipid, so a glycolipid. Or you might have a sugar molecule like this attached to a protein, so we'd call it a glycoprotein. And both glycolipids and glycoproteins, they serve as basically um, cell signaling molecules, meaning they can help the cell uh, portray a little bit about what it is. So cells can kind of bump into one another and they can communicate by looking at what types of these uh, molecules are on the surface. And that's one of the ways that one cell could identify another cell as being, let's say, a blood cell versus a a fat cell or something. Okay, so that allows the cell to, to sort of present itself to the external world. Also, it serves as a little attachment site for things to bind to. So we got a lot going on here in the plasma membrane. It's not just a thin film of oil, even though that is predominantly what the chemistry is here of the inner parts of the membrane. Remember, we said this is nonpolar, um, but there's a whole bunch of other activity happening here as well. An interesting procedure that has been done to better view the plasma membrane is what's known as freeze fracture. And in this uh, procedure, what they do is they super, super, super cool the cell to the point that the membrane is very frozen. It's very brittle. And when it's very brittle, they can actually fracture it, which means that the top you know, layer of all of the phospholipids gets separated from the bottom layer. And then it exposes all of the goodies that were hiding inside of the plasma membrane. Uh, this is a picture showing that procedure. So this would be the, the top of a cell, the plasma membrane. And then right here, you can see this little chunk has been chipped off of it. So now we can see all of the little 
goodies that are inside there, sandwiched between the two phosphate heads of the phospholipid bilayer. And there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. These are all like little proteins here. So this is why we do call it a mosaic, because it does form this interesting little pattern. Okay, um, all cells will have a couple of other features to them. This picture is showing some cheek cells. So if you were to just go ahead and swab some cheek cells, they would look like this. Each one of these is a cell, 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 cell. And you can see the, the little dark staining nucleus in there. Okay, well, we already talked about the plasma membrane. Other stuff that cells will have is um, cytoplasm. Cytoplasm is all the stuff that's inside the cell, basically. Uh, inside the cell, there's a kind of a jelly-like substance. It's basically the way that I think about it is think about water and then thinking about adding a whole bunch of stuff to that water to the point it's so full of stuff that it's dissolved that it starts to become a little bit more jelly-like. That is the composition of the cytoplasm. The jelly-like substance is called cytosol, and when you add a whole bunch of other stuff to it, like cytoskeleton uh, proteins or organelles or whatnot, we call that whole rich mis mixture of stuff cytoplasm. All cells have got cytoplasm. Okay, all cells will have ribosomes. These are very, very small um, protein-making factories that are spread around throughout the cell in different places. And all cells will have a genome. So four things all cells have, regardless of what type of cell it is. Okay, now you can divide a cell into one of two categories. Either it is a prokaryote or it is a eukaryote. Any cell in the world will be one of these two categories. Uh, eukaryotes are cells that have organelles to them. Um, Membrane-bound organelles. So basically above and beyond the plasma membrane there's going to be additional plasma membranes or phospholipid membranes that wrap around uh, different substances and we call those membrane bound organelles. Those are found in eukaryotes. They are not found in prokaryotes. This this word means, uh, prokaryote means before a nucleus. Um, so it's thought to be the cell that had come onto the scene before the more complex eukaryotes arrived, depending on your on your philosophical presupposition. Okay, so let's compare and contrast these here. Um, this is two illustrations of one of each. This over here is the prokaryote. Prokaryotes are generally smaller. Um, these are bacterial cells, and generally all they have is a genome, which is a single chromosome. Here it looks kind of like a big old pile of spaghetti. And then um, they're going to have some little ribosomes in the cytoplasm, but they won't have much beyond that in terms of subcellular things that do stuff, okay? Whereas in a eukaryotic cell, you've got not just a single chromosome, you've got a whole nucleus full of stuff, and it's wrapped in its individual little package, the nuclear envelope, and you've got all these other things inside of there doing different kinds of stuff. And then it's usually quite a bit bigger. So that's a little bit of the difference here. So let's quick talk about some of the organelles that might be found might be found in a eukaryotic cell. This is a picture from a textbook that shows a really great illustration of a cell. Um, all of the the microscopic nano structures kind of inside of the cell. And if we peruse through this picture, we'll we'll uh, note a few things. We'll find the nucleus of the cell, and that's going to be this thing that we see right here. Inside the nucleus is where the genome is housed. So this would be like the, like I said earlier, the genome is like the library that contains all of the instruction manuals required to build all of this stuff and anything that the cell will need in the future or does need. Currently all of those, the, the blueprints or the instruction manuals to build all the stuff that the cell needs are housed right here. And as I was saying earlier, I'm still not convinced that 
all the information required to build an organism can fit inside the, the genome and fit inside the nucleus. I mean, I think that all the information required to build what the cell needs could fit in there. But in, when we talk about the, all the information required to take one cell and turn it into 100 trillion cells that are all found to be in the exact right spot and how they're all finding their right spot based upon previous instructions that they've been passed down from their precursor cells. Like I, I just can't even fathom the amount of information it would take, the amount of forethought that would be in that uh, process embedded in the DNA. And I, so I, I just believe it's the hand of God that actually orchestrates the development of an organism, and then it's just the genome that runs it once it's uh, mostly established. But that's my own personal bias. Okay, uh, you'll also find. Well, let me back up. On the on the nucleus, it's going to have its own membrane, which is called the nuclear envelope. And then note here that there are pores. This is important because this is how the photocopies get out of the cell. Remember we said that there's DNA in here, which forms a genome, but then there's also this thing called mRNA, which can be made. And mRNA is like a, a photocopy of one little page of the library that is DNA. So that little photocopy has to get out somewhere into the cell so that it can bring the instruction manual to the place where the protein will be built. And the way that it escapes is it passes through these nuclear pores. Okay. Uh, surrounding the nucleus will be what's known as the endoplasmic reticulum, and that's this labyrinth of um, membrane-bound sacs that you see here, and we're kind of seeing a, a cross-section of it. Endoplasmic reticulum can either be smooth or it can be uh, rough. If it's smooth, we call it the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. If it's rough, we call it the rough endoplasmic reticulum. The difference between the two is that rough endoplasmic reticulum is studded with ribosomes. So if we look really closely here, we'll see these tiny little red things all throughout this labyrinth here of, of membranes, and those are going to be ribosomes. And so generally how it works is that um, a large percentage of proteins are built in this um, in this reticulum here, in this endoplasmic reticulum. So what happens is the messenger RNA, the photocopy of the genome, is being sent out to some place in the cell to make a protein. A lot of times what happens is that it comes through the nuclear pore, goes right in to the um, endoplasmic reticulum, and then it finds a ribosome, and then the ribosome uses that information to build a protein. And then there will be a protein that's built inside here, and it traverses along and gets modified and changed so that by the time it's made its way through this maze, it is a fully functional protein that needs to do what it needs to do. That's the rough ER. Okay, the smooth ER we can see over here, this doesn't have any uh, ribosomes on it, so it doesn't actually make protein this makes a lot of um, lipid type substances. So uh, for example, a lot of the phospholipids that make up the cell membrane, it's thought that this is the place that they're made. Another thing that the smooth endoplasmic reticulum will do is uh, detoxify substances. So for example, um, various drugs that are administered to somebody, they have their effect for a while, but then eventually they are brought to the smooth ER and they're broken down. Now, the endoplasmic reticulum works hand in hand with this other organelle called the Golgi apparatus, and together we call these two the endomembrane system, because how it works is that anything that's made from any protein here that's made in the rough ER, and I suppose probably also the smooth ER, is generally when it's finished being made, it's going to be packaged up into a little membrane-bound sphere, which is known as a vesicle, so in the proteins go, and then that merges with this organelle that we see here. This is the Golgi apparatus. 
the Golgi apparatus basically receives all of those products that have been made in the endoplasmic reticulum. And then you can think about the Golgi apparatus is often uh, considered to be something like a post office. Whereas in the same way, a post office would collect everybody's outgoing letters, sort them, and then send them out to where they need to go. That's kind of what the Golgi apparatus does. It collects all of the products made by the endoplasmic reticulum. It packages them up further, and then it puts a tag on them. And the tag will tell the cell uh, what's supposed to happen to those products. Generally, there's three things that could happen to anything that makes its way to the Golgi apparatus. It could be exported outside of the cell. So um, it would be packaged up into a little vesicle like this. That vesicle would merge with the plasma membrane and spill out its contents. Or it could be packaged up into a, a vesicle like this and be brought to the membrane and um, poured into the membrane. So then those proteins would now be part of the membrane, just like we saw in that previous picture, all of those proteins that were embedded in the membrane. Well, they probably got there from a, uh, a riding in a sphere that was uh, sent out from the Golgi apparatus. Or what could happen is that they are broken down so that this thing here would merge with another organelle that breaks stuff down. Those are kind of the three fates of something that's brought to the Golgi apparatus. But in either case, um, it will receive, it will process, and then it will ship them out to somewhere else in the cell. There are mitochondria in a eukaryotic cell, and these we generally consider to be the powerhouse of the cell because they are what make energy. And the thing that they are most famous for making is a molecule known as ATP. This is a big, very popular, important molecule to know about. A and ATP is what's considered the energy currency of the cell. What we mean by this is in the same way um, if you work a summer job, in exchange for all of the labor that you invest in that job, they'll give you a paper piece of paper or a cyberspace number, right? You'll get money, dollars. Those dollars are just a placeholder for all the work that you've done. And then you can use those dollars to then spend somewhere else and perhaps, you know, have work done for you. So you work a really big summer job to make some money. You take that money and you pay it to a mechanic to fix your car. You're just basically trading your work for their work, and then the means of transfer is the currency, the, the dollars, right? Well, in either case, uh, that's how your cell works. It, if it has, uh, if it makes energy, it can load it up and store it in this molecule called ATP, and then the ATP can go somewhere else in the cell and later release the energy. So a lot of uh, what cells do and how they work is principally driven by, uh, is powered by the production and the breakdown of this molecule ATP. Well, it's made in the mitochondria, these little um, organelles here. Okay, uh, there could be lysosomes. That would be something that we see here, these little um, spheres, which are basically just spheres of, of material that's very similar to the phospholipid bilayer of the plasma membrane. And inside of these spheres, we call them vesicles, is kind of the general word for any type of sphere that's made out of phospholipid bilayer that can hold something. In these vesicles, there are certain digestive enzymes that can break down uh, materials. So if anything needs to be destroyed or, or taken care of, the cell's got to get rid of something, it can kind of send it to the incinerator, so to speak, send it to the lysosome. There's also one called a peroxisome. Both of them do kind of the same thing, generally speaking. They break stuff down. So those could be in a cell. Uh, the ribosomes we've already talked about, but they can either be fixed or free. Fixed means that they're attached generally to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Free means they're out hanging out in the cytosol. So we can see both of those in this uh, illustration here. Some of them are attached to the rough ER and some of them are free. 
ribosomes are the place that protein is made. So it's the site of protein synthesis. So anytime there's a mRNA made, a photocopy of the genome, it will eventually find its way, most of the times it will find its way to a ribosome so that it can use that those instructions here to, to make protein at the site of the ribosome. There are also centrioles, and centrioles are these barrel-shaped structures here, and they just kind of hang out until the cell is ready to divide. These are what, what form the, um, what's known as the mitotic spindle apparatus. which is basically just a network of tubes that are able to push and pull chromosomes uh, to different parts of the cell. So generally the centrioles, they play the biggest role, ultimately what I'm trying to say, in cell division. When a cell gets ready to divide, we go to the centrioles and they're going to make it happen for us. Okay. Um, a couple others here that are, are not shown on this particular uh, illustration. This illustration is of an animal cell, but um, if this was a plant cell, there would be additional structures found in it. Some of the, the big ones here are, are chloroplasts, and then also many plant cells have a big central vacuole, which is just like a huge storage tank for stuff. Chloroplasts, uh, you can think about chloroplasts being like solar panels. They make energy, but they don't make energy the same way a mitochondria does. They make energy by absorbing light and using that light energy to make energy molecules. All right, so that's a little bit about what a cell might look like and specifically the types of organelles that might be found in a eukaryotic cell. Keep in mind, if this is a prokaryotic cell, such as a bacterium, we wouldn't find any of these in there, except for the, the ribosomes would be in there. But we wouldn't find mitochondria or Golgi apparatus or an endoplasmic reticulum or a nucleus, none of that stuff. Some bacteria do have uh, chloroplasts in them, but that's not always the case. All right, uh, let's talk now about membrane transport. Membrane transport is an important concept because uh, it gets to the heart about how it is that cells can maintain homeostasis. We already talked a little bit about what homeostasis is. It's keeping the internal conditions uh, constant and isolated and separate from the external con uh, conditions of the world. And the way that this is achieved is through how cells can get rid of stuff or import stuff into their cell. All right, so consider this. This is a another illustration of the plasma membrane. And let's imagine that this is outside of the cell. And let's imagine that this is inside of the cell. And in between the outside and the inside stands the nonpolar barrier here of fatty acids. And then there's also all of these proteins and stuff. So when we talk about how stuff gets into, uh, or sorry, into and out of a cell, we can basically categorize those modes of transport into two camps. One passive transport, the other active transport. Now the difference between these is very simple. Basically, passive transport does not require additional energy put into the transport. Active transport is just the opposite. It does require additional energy. Oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes that additional energy is is in the form of breaking down ATP to fuel the movement of a substance somewhere. 
Okay, another thing about passive, types of movement that do not require energy are the types of movement where something goes down its concentration gradient. Okay, this word, concentration gradient, um, is a very important concept in biology. So we just have to pause here to talk about what that means. Okay, so consider this for a second. Let's say I drop like a big crystal of salt or sugar. Let's say, oh, let's say it's a sugar cube. You know, think about those sugar cubes people put in their coffee. Let's say I drop one of those in a, in a thing of water. Right at the site that I drop it, it's going to start dissolving. So there's a bunch of particles. And then over time, those, those particles will kind of sprawl out a little bit more into uh, the fluid in which they're dissolving. Something like this. Okay. Well, our definition of concentration, how concentrated something is, basically just refers to the amount of stuff per uh, given volume. So, for example, if I drew like a uh, if I drew like a square box here, and I drew that uh, roughly the exact same size box here, if I look here, there's a whole bunch of those particles in that given region. So we would call that a high concentration relative to this one, which only has one small little particle in there for the same volume. So that we so this what we would say is like a low concentration uh, relative to this one. And if I drew kind of the same size box like here, there's two particles in there. So this is more of like a medium size concentration. So how it works is we have a concentration gradient because it's, it's higher over here. And then as we get further out, it becomes less and less and less. It's going from high concentration down to a low concentration. Okay, that's what we mean by concentration gradient. In this point roughly here, it's high concentration. In this point way back here, it's low concentration. And from here to there, it decreases and decreases and decreases in its concentration at any point that you were to take a sample. Concentration gradient. All right, so for passive, it's stuff that goes down its concentration gradient. So passive going down means for uh, means for some sort of substance to go from a high concentration and move more towards a low concentration. The way we abbreviate concentration is with these little brackets here. So I'll just go ahead and do that. So high concentration to a low concentration. If there, there are these conditions where there's a lot of something in one place and not a lot of something in another place, the tendency will be for that thing to move in this direction. And it just does that by the sheer uh, molecular movements responsible. It doesn't require any additional energy. So for example, let's say I have a whole bunch of particles outside of the membrane. Okay, and I don't have very many of those particles inside the membrane. If allowed, these particles will want to move into the cell. Okay, let's, so let's say this is inside the cell, this is outside the cell. And the reason for it is just that as these particles are all bumping into one another, they wanna, they wanna sprawl out, they wanna get a little bit more room for themselves, you know, not unlike somebody who's uh, lived in the, a small house without a lot of yard and they wanna move out to the country to have more space. Right? So that's kind of what particles want to do. They want to have more space to themselves because they bump into each other and the more they bump into each other, the more they spread out. So if you have a lot of particles in a given volume here and not very many here, if allowed, they will pass through. Now, one of the caveats here is that not everything can just flow right through the membrane. In fact, most things cannot. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, contrast that to active transport, active transport is usually stuff going up the concentration gradient. 
So, and that's why it requires additional energy. It's not the normal natural thing for particles to do. This one's going down concentration gradient. Okay. Now, the different types of uh, passive transport, one is called passive, or sorry, one's called basically simple diffusion. And in simple diffusion, something just goes from a high concentration to a low concentration, and furthermore, it goes right through the membrane. Nothing else is required. Now, this doesn't generally happen with everything, but the types of things that can undergo simple diffusion are going to be things that are small, very, very, very small molecules. An example of a very small, small molecule is um, CO2 or uh, oxygen. Now, these are very small because it's literally just three atoms or two atoms. O2 would be two oxygen atoms bound together. CO2 would be two ox oxygen atoms bound to a carbon atom. So something that's only got two atoms or three atoms is a very small molecule. And it can, it can even if it's uh, polar or nonpolar, it can go right through the membrane. This is why red blood cells, when they pass through um, the, your lungs, are able to offload or uptake gases such as CO2 or O2 quite rapidly. Okay. Another type of thing that could go through do th simple diffusion would be something that's nonpolar. The reason for that is we said that the membrane is mostly nonpolar. Like if we look at this thing, a good chunk of the depth here of the of the membrane is nonpolar. We did say that these phosphate heads on the phospholipids are polar but they're very, very small. So if we consider something that's nonpolar, let's say uh, an example here would be like a um, oil droplet. An oil droplet, let's draw a picture here, is my oil droplet. If there was a lot of oil outside of the cell and not much in, and so it wanted to diffuse in, it would encounter some resistance here as it hit the phosphate heads because now we've got these these polar charged molecules trying to repel the nonpolar molecule but the small oil droplet is willing to to run the gauntlet here because of the, fa the fact that all of its comrades are lying just underneath it has molecular structures underneath to which it's attracted because it's similar to them you know an oil droplet outside of the cell is like kind of a a fish out of water, so to speak, because surrounding the oil droplet would be water everywhere. So you got this oil droplet that's like, get me out of here. I don't want to be around all this these water molecules. So it wants to try and go in to this safe zone where there's not as many water molecules. And so because of the fact that there's a higher concentration and a lower concentration, we have a concentration gradient favoring it to go into the cell. And also because it is nonpolar, it's able to push through the polar heads so that it can then join its nonpolar comrades. And then the concentration gradient will keep pushing it further to get through to the other side. So all that to say, things that are small, things that are nonpolar, are able to go right through the membrane given the fact that there would be a concentration gradient to favor them to do so. So if there is a high concentration out of the cell and a low concentration in the cell, and the thing is either small or nonpolar, it will go into the cell just all by itself. It won't need any extra coaxing. It won't need any extra energy expenditure to do that. Okay, That's simple diffusion. Basically, something goes from a high concentration to a low concentration. Nothing else is required. Another type of diffusion is known as facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion is basically simple diffusion, but with a little help. So it requires a channel protein.
or this thing called a carrier, either one. But basically it just requires a protein to allow it to go through. So let's imagine that something is polar and there's a concentration gradient to favor it going inside the cell. An example of this would be uh, like, um, an example of this would be, let's say, uh, some molecule of glucose. So let's imagine I've got a whole bunch of these molecules of glucose. Glucose is a monosaccharide. It's got quite a few oxygen and hydrogen bonds to it. So it's polar. And let's say there's a whole bunch of them outside the cell, but only a few of them inside the cell. So these want to push in toward the cell, toward the inside of the cell. They can't do it though because they can't make it through this big nonpolar area of the membrane. It's just too thick. It's too adverse for them to, uh, to make it through. They're electrically repelled by that area. So while they're drawn to the phosphate head, they can't go down any further because underlying it is a big uh, web of nonpolar molecules, and this one is polar. But if there's a gateway inserted into the membrane, then they can diffuse. So this is um, what facilitated diffusion means, is that it'll, it's the, just the diffusion of something from a high concentration to a low concentration uh, requiring a additional thing like a like a channel a pore or a protein uh, basically a tunnel needs to be put into the membrane so that it can pass from out to in or from in to out depending on the concentration gradient okay so that is uh the big types of passive diffusion would be simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion simple it doesn't require anything but it's it can only be done by molecules of certain properties, either those that are small or nonpolar. Facilitated requires a channel protein, but it doesn't really matter uh, what the nature, the chemical nature is of the molecule, as long as there's a concentration gradient to favor its movement, and it's got the, the right um, channel that it can pass through, it will do so. Okay, now let's talk more about active transport. That's when a molecule goes up concentration gradient and there are a couple of ways that this happens uh, I think for our purposes we're just going to concern ourselves with what's known as primary active transport there is also what's known secondary active transport but we won't worry about that in this class Okay, primary active transport requires these things known as pumps. And pumps generally require ATP to operate. So an example of this would be, and we said active transport is when something's going up its concentration gradient. So an example of this would be, um, let's say I've got a whole bunch of molecules outside of the cell. and um, only a couple inside. First, I'll ask you, where is the concentration gradient? Is it favoring the movement of stuff outside the cell, or is it favoring the movement of stuff inside the cell? See if you can answer that without me telling you. The answer is that the concentration gradient would favor stuff going into the cell, because that's the natural way that things want to move. They want to go from a high concentration to a low concentration. Occasionally though, this isn't how the thing needs to move. And so if this is the case, then we need to rely not on simple diffusion, we need to rely on active transport. So if this was the case, there'd be a pump here, and that pump would use ATP as an energy source, ATP would come up to this pump, it would break its molecule, it would send a jolt of energy into the pump, which I'll illustrate with this really cool lightning bolt. Okay, And as soon as that energy has been transferred to the pump, it shoots something out of the cell, going from a low concentration up, 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 up its concentration gradient, but going outside of the cell. This isn't the, a natural way that something would want to move on its own. 
but if we power it with a pump, we can actually shoot it uh, into a high concentration gradient. It requires some energy though, it requires ATP. So that's what active transport is. Okay, um, big difference again, this is going down its concentration gradient, this is going up its concentration gradient. This requires no additional energy, this requires a little additional energy. Um, a couple other types of movement here are exocytosis and endocytosis. This is generally um, when we're trying to move large quantities of something into and out of the cell. Basically how it works is that in exocytosis, let's imagine this is the cell here. In exocytosis, let's say that there's some vesicle. Again, a vesicle is just a sphere um, made by like a, you know, a phospholipid bilayer. And let's say there's some important substance in there. And that is something that's been made in the cell that now needs to be brought out of the cell. Well, we can just send this little cargo van here, the vesicle full of what's required to export out of the cell. We can send that up to the plasma membrane. This can actually fuse with the membrane. So it would look at that point, it would look something like more like this, where it's fusing now with the membrane and then all of those contents are being spilt out. That's exocytosis. Endocytosis is just the exact opposite. You have a uh, membrane bound vesicle out of the cell. It's got some stuff in it and it's coming up, up, up to the cell. And then this membrane actually fuses with the plasma membrane to look something more like this and all of those contents just kind of enter the cell as this membrane becomes actually an extension or part of the plasma membrane. So it's a way to move large quantities of stuff into and out of the cell. It generally, this is generally a type of active transport because it requires oftentimes a little bit of ATP to make all of these um, things bind together and merge together. Okay, one last type of transport here that we're going to talk about, uh, which is pretty important, is osmosis. Osmosis refers to the movement, or specifically the diffusion, I guess I should say, of water. So water is also a substance that likes to go from a high concentration to a low concentration. Anytime something is going from a high concentration to a low concentration, it's called diffusion. But with water, there are actually some interesting uh, properties here. So consider this. Um, some of the practical applications of understanding osmosis would be the proper use of saline solution administered um, in an IV. You know, have you ever wondered why it is that they put these these bags up and they you know connect people up to them and then the, the fluid drips into a person well it's to replenish volume but this isn't just a bag of water it's actually super 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 important how much salt is in this water there's a little bit of salt in here and if that salt concentration is off just by a little bit it could lead to very devastating effects for the cells of the individual receiving that fluid and here's why. Okay, so let's imagine, <laughs> let's imagine like a colossally huge red blood cell. Okay, your red blood cells would never be this large. And let's imagine I put this in a beaker of water. Okay, so here it is. There's a there's a cell and some water. Now, the cell is going to have a certain concentration of solute in it. You know, if I tally up all of the sodium ions and the potassium ions and the proteins and everything, all that's in there, if I figure out how many particles per volume of water is in the cell, it's going to be some value. Okay, so we'll, we'll just illustrate that with these particles I've drawn. And let's imagine now that I put that into a fluid that actually has many, many more particles to it. I mean, it's just chock full of particles surrounding particles everywhere. This type of scenario, in this type of scenario, this fluid that's surrounding the cell 
would be considered hypertonic. Tonic basically refers to how salty something is or how many particles are dissolved in a fluid. And so relative to the cell, the fluid has more particles per volume. So it's hyper, more salty than the cell. That's all this word really means. It's hyper means above, tonic means salty. So it's really, really salty above and beyond what is the cell. In this scenario, water is going to want to move. Uh, because water is more permeable, water can move into and out of the cell, whereas things like salts are uh, stuck either inside the cell or outside of the cell. These little salts, they wouldn't really be able to move, make their way into and out of the cell because they would be uh, polar and they can't make it through the membrane. So where you have water can move in and out, the, the amount of particles is pretty much fixed. We call this uh, feature of the membrane semi permeability. This is a kind of an important word, meaning some stuff can just go into and out of the cell membrane like water, other stuff cannot, like salt, part, salt uh, particles. So in this scenario, I usually just, the easiest way to remember it um, is just to remember that water is the particle party animal. Sorry, again, can't spell. It always wants to go to the region where there are more particles per a given volume. So again, if I was to draw a box here, we would say there's just a handful of particles. If I was to draw that same box here per the same given a volume, there's much more particles. So this is much more concentrated out here than inside the cell. So it's actually going to want to pull water out because water wants to try and equilibrate the difference between the two environments. Water, if there's more water that can be drawn out here, it will actually dilute this a little bit more so that this environment and this environment have roughly the same saltiness. So a general feature is if you put a cell in a solution that's hypertonic, meaning more salty than the cell, it will suck the water out. And this is a bad thing because what happens is it sucks the water out. At least it's a bad thing in our for our red blood cells. And then the cells get really shriveled. All the water leaves the cell and then they get shriveled up and they potentially could be destroyed. So if somebody gave an individual an IV um, connected to a bag that had fluid that was on average more salty than the fluid that's in your body as soon as that salty fluid went into that person's body it would start to shrivel up that person's cells because the fluid that would be administering to that person would be more salty than what the cells normally are it would be hypertonic okay um a condition where something is isotonic means that it's the relative same amount of saltiness outside of the cell as it is inside of the cell. So there is no net movement. Water can go in, water can go out, but the amount of water that goes in is the same as the amount of water that goes out because the concentration of all the salt is the same. So there's no net movement of water into or out of the cell. This is what you would want to achieve if you were administering a, a salt solution to somebody to give them more fluids. Um, generally the amount of salt that is put in those bags is about 0 0.9 percent uh, meaning of all the volume about less than almost one percent of that volume is uh, salt particles and that's about how it is in our cells so this is the isotonic solution here this is what we would go for on the flip side if you were to just um, give somebody a bag of water and have it drip into their body and it didn't have any salt in it whatsoever, well then we would have a condition where there are more particles in the red blood cells, or any of the cells for that matter, and no particles outside. So in this case, where is water going to want to go? We've got water inside the cell, we've got water outside the cell. In the end of the day, the net movement of water is towards the place where there are more particles. So you'd have 
more water going into the cell to try and dilute out this uh, particle party here. <laughs> okay, if that happens, the cell would swell and potentially explode. So this would be an example of what's known as a hypotonic solution, one in which the fluid surrounding the cell is less hypo salty than it is inside the cell. And it's going to draw water in because water wants to go to the place where there's particles hanging out. It would make the water swell up or make the cell swell up with water and potentially burst. So at the end of the day, if um, you know, if you ever decide to go into healthcare and you're ever in the urgent care room or the emergency room and you see Professor Stelzer come in uh, and you're going to try and give me some more fluids because I'm dehydrated, don't hook me up to a bag of pure water. <laughs> I don't want your pure water. That water's got to have a little bit of salt in it um, so that all my cells don't get full of water and explode. Okay, so it's pretty important stuff on a clinical, in a clinical setting.